Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Today in Titletown Packers podcast. My name is Griffin. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at All Day Packers, and I'm joined today, as always, by my co-host, Braun and Mason. You can follow Braun on Instagram at Lambo Leapers, and you can follow Mason on Instagram and Twitter at Packer Post. How are you guys doing? I'm doing good, Griff. It's good to be back after a little two-week hiatus, but we're back, and we just got a good win against the Giants, and kind of got to wrap, wrap everything up that's happened in these past two weeks in this podcast, so I'm, I'm excited to get started. Yeah, it's nice to be back from the holiday, and uh, we're going to cover everything uh, that's transpired over the past couple of weeks and and look forward to uh, some meaningful December football that we have coming up here. So, uh, yeah, everything's going good, and the uh, Packers are 9-3 uh, and three at this point, and we're looking to keep that train rolling. Yeah, you guys pretty much summed it up. Uh, Packers are 9-3, and three. not much to complain about after this week. A pretty convincing win against the New York Giants. Um, but last week we didn't do a podcast because of the Thanksgiving. We couldn't figure out a schedule and we just couldn't t- find time to get one out. But last week there was <laughs> a lot to be unhappy with that. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of the 49ers game, the 37 to 8 blowout loss from the Packers. Uh, you know, we're going to touch on that since we never got the chance to. Uh, but mainly we're going to be talking about the Giants game from last week and looking forward to the Redskins game this Sunday. But first, as always, we have some news. Um, the Packers claimed uh, Tyler Irvin running back off of waivers earlier this week from Jacksonville, and he's going to be their main return guy in both punts and kickoffs, Matt LaFleur said today. And uh, as a corresponding move, they also waived uh, cornerback Traymond Smith. Uh, he was our main punt return, kick return guy, and he wasn't setting the world on fire by any means. So, uh, I mean, I guess it makes sense to bring in an, a, a, new, a, new, a new face to the return game kind of test out a new guy back there. Uh, what, what are you guys' thoughts on that? Yeah, Matt LaFleur seems to like uh, his versatility on the offensive side of the ball, too. He he kind of said that he likes his ability to line up in the slot, and he says he can do some nice things in the run game as well. I doubt we see him in that aspect on the field, but uh, Tremont Smith was just – he was just not working for us. You know, he, he had potential. He, he showed a lot of things in Kansas City last year, but uh, he just – it was it was too close. I mean, he had almost a few turnovers that, that looked like where we could, you know, lose the ball on a on a kickoff return or punt return. And we just can't have any. We have to be kind of tight now in this December football uh, mentality that we're in. And I, I think Tyler Irvin can bring something maybe a little safer than than what Tremont Smith could. And he never showed us anything that, you know, kind of forced us to keep him around. And I think Brian Gudikins did a great job of, you know, recognizing something wasn't working and moving on and trying to get something else that will work. So uh, hopefully it works out for us. We need it big time. Yeah, the Packers could definitely use a, use a little boost on special teams. This this unit this year is just as bad as it was last year, but this time it's in the on the punt return game. Last year was, you know, we had troubles with fielding kick returns. I don't want to mention any names, but it was just a disaster last year and now this year. You guys have probably seen the stats. The Packers have negative eight punt return yards so far through through 12 games, which would, if it ended right now, would be an NFL record by 30, 36 yards. So, yeah, the punt return unit right now is playing <laughs> like one of the worst units ever. So, yeah, the Packers definitely need something new, just, just something that could give a little boost because obviously it's not working at the moment. Yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of said this a few weeks ago, but in comparison to last year's special teams, it is better, I think. Uh, you know, we're not doing anything. Negative eight punt return yards is ridiculously bad, but last season, the special teams was literally losing us games. It was ridiculous. Every single week, there was some kind of blunder. There was a million penalties on every kickoff and punt return and punt. It was ridiculous. But this year, there's no production, even a little bit. But they're not harming the team, and I special teams, does it really matter? I mean, it makes good teams great. It can do that, but I don't think it really matters. Um, so that, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a claim. You know, that's, that's a bold claim, I would say. I feel like, I mean, that's, that's, what, that's, that's what wins you football games. What separates good teams from great teams, like you said, is, you know, the special teams aspect where you're flipping the field or you're getting yourself in good field position, or, or you're making a play, you know, knocking the ball out of a, of a returner's hands and, you know, getting that extra possession for the offense to kind of take advantage, you know, even in a close matchup. Things like that, that's what separates good teams from great teams, and, and that's why teams like the New England Patriots, you know, 
their teams are always in the top three in special teams every year, uh, regardless of what they do on the, on the on the two other sides of the ball. And they're always in the mix, whether it's the Super Bowl or, you know, AFC Championship. They're always in the mix. And part of that is because of their special teams unit. And Bill Belichick makes sure that's a stout unit every year. So uh, we've, we've been in a transition period on special teams for sure. Obviously, our two guys, Mason Crosby and J.K. Scott, have, have been playing very well for us this year. And J.K., he had a, he had a little rough patch uh, last month kind of kind of played poorly for a month and he rebounded against the Giants but uh, Mason's been incredible for us this year maybe his best year of his career so just the part that we need help with really is just the return game and blocking in the return game and we did really well against the Giants covering kicks so I just think the most important thing is to get a guy back there can that can spark that unit and, and hopefully we can get better coverage out there for him to to make a big gain uh, and make a big play for us when we need it most. Yeah, I don't know if it really separates the good teams from the great teams. I feel like it it can make a good team great because, like the Ravens, they always have a great special team. So, I mean, John Harbaugh is uh, of a special teams background. Like, we've seen them go from good to great because of their special teams. But I don't think great teams are required to have a good special teams. I mean, we are, like you said, we are very good in the kicking game and we're most of the time pretty good in the punting game with J.K. Scott. So I don't think the returns really matter. It definitely matters for field position, which is helpful. But when we're scoring points every week um, and we're 9-3, and three, I don't think it's really that big of a deal like it was last year. Because last year, it made a good team bad. That's like that's the kind of difference it had last year. Um, but on Tyler Irvin, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, like you said, there's not a lot Traymond Smith did to keep his job, but – I don't think he lost his job in any way. I mean, I think he just – the blocking is really the issue. On the kickoffs and the punt return, there's no room to move because there's a guy in your face as soon as he catches the ball. Uh, we saw that with Darius Shepard. He he had that one punt that he – and I think it was Detroit. He didn't fair catch it, and he got tackled and fumbled. Um, so we've seen that happen a lot. So I think, it's, I think the blocking is the main issue, and I don't know if this Tyler Irvin j- is going to be like – some, some kind of spark that we needed and all of a sudden we're going to be a great punt return team because at the end of the day it does come down to the blocking and Sean Manega is he is he a good special teams coordinator I don't know you can't really know that stuff and so I don't, I don't know if he's going to stick around I think he might really be an issue maybe it's the talent on the special teams but at the end of the day like I said special teams doesn't really matter to me uh, you guys may feel differently but I I just don't think it matters that much it's just nice once in a while to get a little spark from your kick return or punt return team. I We've never really had a solid kick return. Maybe, maybe Micah Hyde might have been the last one. It's just, uh, as a Packer fan, you, we just haven't really ever relied on, you know, a kick return or a punt return to get us into field goal range right away or even a touchdown. So, I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty indifferent about it. Yeah, that I do agree with. I mean, it would be really nice if Tyler Irvin all of a sudden comes in and gets us in great field position. That's the thing. That's the thing that really hurts us, especially last month when JK was kind of going through a uh, a down period in his punting game. Like he he would have every punt was almost every punt was terrible. Like he was averaging just over 30 yards per punt, which is awful. And uh so the defense would constantly have to cover short fields and where the often the opposing offense is practically in field goal range by the time they start their drive. And then on our side of the ball uh we would get no return yardage on punt returns or kick returns so our offense would have long fields to drive down and that is an area that i can definitely see the argument that that's hurting us as a team um if tyler Irvin can help in that area then i think he will have some value just maybe he'll make one man miss that Tremont smith maybe couldn't or darius shepherd or anyone we've had back there uh but i, I just don't really see any value in this this claim all we need this point i mean the way we win football games it, it really hasn't had anything to do with special teams apart from obviously you know kicking and punting yeah we've won by you know getting out to early leads and creating turnovers and kind of pushing you know pushing the pace a little bit and making teams have to come back and you know throw at us the special teams aspect of our team hasn't really helped us win games and if we continue with the formula that we've ran with for nine wins this year then it's hard for me to say that even the slightest uptick will have a, a huge impact on 
on what we do going forward. But it, it definitely couldn't hurt. And I mean, the you know the more the better field position that we can get going on offense, it obviously will just it'll just help us. But I mean, we'll see what happens. I don't know. It it really I do think it has a lot to do with the coverage, but. I don't know. We're just going to have to see what happens. Hopefully this helps, but we'll see. All right. Our next piece of news here is actually from last week, but we never got the chance to talk about it. So uh, the Packers claimed offensive lineman Jared Veldier from the New England Patriots. He was actually on the reserve retired list because he announced his retirement at the start of the season. But when he said he was uh, wanting to come back to the team, the Patriots just didn't want him, I guess. So they, they waived him and the Packers claimed him off of waivers. And He's now on the 53-man roster. I mean, he's not he's not an all-pro talent or anything, but it's a really nice piece of depth to have, especially when we're dealing with Brian Balaga, who has an MCL sprain. He's playing through it, played last week. He's a warrior, but, uh, you know, he's been injury-prone in the past, so it's nice to have that insurance behind him that he's reliable. Jared Vildier is a reliable player. He's a veteran, obviously, so uh, it's nice to have a guy like that. Yeah, after we saw Brian Balaga get hurt in the Niners game, we kind of saw Alex Light get beat up by that Niners pass rush, so... Picking up Jared Valdir here is just a nice little little backup in case something does happen to Brian Blaga's knee that, you know, forces him to miss more, more games. And Alex Light is very in, inexperienced, but and Jared Valdir has is a is a nine, ten year vet and actually played in uh, Denver last year with our right guard Billy Turner. So a little chemistry there and he's he's just gonna be there just in case anything happens to Brian Blaga. So I, I, I thought it was a solid waiver claim and you know, if he if anything happens, we have a experienced tackle now. Yeah, definitely uh, not very often when when you see a guy like him, a, a veteran guy with what is it, eight years of experience playing in the NFL, just you know, just floating out there. And it was a a very good move for the Packers to pick him up. Uh, he, I mean, he played well last year. He he was actually you know graded somewhere around seventy uh, on PFF uh, with the Broncos last year and. I mean, he's had great experience with uh, with the Cardinals as well and a couple other teams. So uh, he's been around the league a little bit, but he definitely knows how to adapt to different systems and hopefully he can get in the fold quickly uh, because we could definitely use a guy like him uh, if Brian Bulaga does indeed go down. Uh, it's important, to, especially for a playoff team uh, like the Green Bay Packers aspire to be, uh, it's definitely important to have a guy that you could just plug in and kind of not have too much of a drop off. Uh, that's a, that's a big move for us. That way we, you know, when it comes to time where we got to start like, you know, winning games and, and it's the playoffs and, and Brian Bulaga, if he goes out, uh, it'll be important to have a guy that we could just throw in there and, and kind of keep rolling. So uh, I thought it was a very good move. Yep. Not much else to say there, but uh, staying on the offensive line, we have veteran Packers guard Josh Sitton announced that he's going to retire as a Packer earlier today, actually, and he's, he'll be meeting with reporters later this week uh, to hold a press conference, and he, he and his friend TJ Lang, also former Packers guard, are going to be at the game this Sunday, and uh, yeah, that's pretty cool, you know. Uh, they were great players for so long, and Josh Sitton is one of the—both of them, really, are one of the best guards of the decade, I'd say. They were re- they were really, really great for the Packers back in their prime. Yeah, it's going to be nice having the, the veterans in-house for the game versus Washington this Sunday. Yeah, Josh Sitton and TJ Lang, two of the most dependable guards in recent memory for the Packers. And uh, it's great to see Josh Sitton kind of, you know, cement his legacy in Green Bay after departing to uh, the Bears and then Miami and then retiring. Uh, it's going to be great to have him back. And obviously TJ Lang as well, back in the building, uh, back at Lambeau watching the Packers play. Uh, you know, you you couldn't be happier for a guy like Sitton who had a great career. You know, won a Super Bowl. So did so did T.J. Lang. Won won that Super Bowl in 2010. So uh, very great to see both of them come back uh, after both have retired and Sitton actually cementing his legacy in Green Bay. So and hopefully T.J. Lang will get to do that as well uh, when his time comes to make you know kind of stay retired. Now, he's got that uh, actually in his Twitter bio. He has retired unless there's a good offer. So. Uh, you never know with him, but he says he's retired. So, you know, one day I'm sure he'll do the same. Uh, but it's great to see both those guys back in the building for sure. Yeah, two Packer legends. Uh, when I when I think of that era of Aaron Rodgers, like 09 to 2015, TJ Lang and, and Josh Sitton were those, you know, those strong guards making Pro Bowls. And just, I like not a lot of people 
remember offensive linemen, but for Josh Sitton and TJ Lang, they were just very memorable, very good, and held up for a good chunk of Aaron Rodgers' prime right there. And it's awesome to see players want to, you know, come back and sign a one-day contract with the Packers, even though they, you know, played a couple years after with some other teams. So that's always cool. And, you know, it's, it's exciting that both of them are going to be at the game on Sunday. And I hope, uh, I hope Lambeau gives them a nice standing ovation. And with that, we're going to move on to the San Francisco 49ers game from two weeks ago. As we said, never got the chance to talk about that. And I know a lot of Packer fans don't really want to think about that, but we're just going to touch upon it a little bit. So I other of you, what were your general thoughts coming out of that game? I know they weren't positive, but what were they? Yeah, man, it was just super disappointing. This game was supposed to be, you know, a showdown of the two top NFC teams, and we did not play like it at all. It was from the get-go, man, the first drive ending on a on a fumble, giving the, the 49ers the ball on the five-yard line or whatever, just, just from the get-go, we just were out of it. The, no excuses whatsoever, just the Niners just kept – you know, rolling, they, they put up 23 by half and we had zero. And I didn't think we'd have another another game like the Chargers this year. And two weeks later, we did. So I don't know what it is about playing in California. I don't know. Aaron grew up in California. I don't know why he has some of his worst games out west. I I don't I don't know, man. And and as as two weeks have gone by or one week have gone by, we've seen we saw the Niners and the Ravens have a epic game last Sunday against two of the top NFL teams. And then we saw the the Vikings and the Seahawks go at it. And obviously they're two of the, the best NFC teams. So it was just disappointing. This game was supposed to be, you know, a, a potential like playoff preview. And, and we just didn't live up and it was on national TV. So, you know, everybody saw it. Everybody knows. Luckily, we're, we bounced back against a, an easy Giants team the next week. And... Yeah, just a disappointing performance all around. That's that's pretty much all I can say. Yeah, it w- I mean, I hate thinking about what we were all thinking going into that game because it just makes the loss even more embarrassing. Like, <laughs> we have that matchup up from, like, week three when the, when we were both 3-0. and It was like, and the Niners were looking like a real threat. It's like, oh, that Niners game is going to be a good game. And, uh, you know, we had the whole bye week to prepare for that game. We, we were all hyping each other up like, this is going to be a – we're going to make a statement – on Sunday night football, it got flexed to Sunday night football, and we go out and we we score eight points in pretty much garbage time. Uh, it was embarrassing. It was miserable to watch. Me and Braun watched it together, and it was some of the worst times we've had <laughs> as Packer fans. It was awful. Um, Braun, your thoughts on the game? Yeah, it was just a really difficult loss. I mean, you're looking at, like you said, a matchup that everybody was anticipating to be maybe the best game of the year. And, you know, like you said, it was flexed to Sunday Night Football. Everybody anticipating, you know, two juggernauts going at it. Can Aaron Rodgers beat this seemingly unbeatable defense? Uh, You know, can the Packers stop the 49ers complex run game? Uh, You know, can Matt LaFleur beat, you know, maybe his mentor, his friend, you know, Kyle Shanahan? How much do they know about what he's going to do? Things like that. All those different storylines had that game looking like maybe maybe the best game of the year. And we just didn't come to play. And I think that had a lot to do with just, you know, it was just one of those games. Like, And we said that about the Chargers game, but not every team can come out and, and play their best football every week. And, and we're still going through a lot of things. I mean, facing a team like that is something we haven't done at all this year. A team as aggressive as the 49ers, as physical as the 49ers. Uh, it's just not something we faced. And I, I do think a huge factor was that Kyle Shanahan basically knows exactly what Matt LaFleur has in his plan. They probably have very identical playbooks and, and game plans and football philosophies and, and mindsets going into games. They know what each other like to do. And I just I think that went towards the, the more experienced Kyle Shanahan's advantage. So a, a lot of things we could talk about. I mean, we'll go we'll, we'll go into the offense and defense a little bit, break it down. Uh, but overall, you know, we just couldn't get anything going on offense, and and that includes the run game, the pass game, all of it. And on defense, we just we couldn't stop Jimmy Garoppolo, and we couldn't do what we set out to do, and and that was try to take advantage of maybe the weakest part of their team, the quarterback position. And they looked pretty sharp, and Jimmy grew up Jimmy Garoppolo looked pretty sharp, so. Uh, that was just a difficult loss. We just couldn't put it together. 
but yes, we did rebound against the Giants, and we'll get into that game later. But uh, just staying with this 49ers game, I was just it was very disappointing. Uh, but guys, what do you think about uh, our offensive performance that game? What did, what did you guys think? You know, facing a defense like that, I don't know how concerned you guys were at the time, but uh, I was definitely not very uh, not very pleased with where we were because you know going into a month of December, we had to really we really had to show that we could we could play with the big boys and. No, we didn't do that. I think the offensive issues really just started with um, Matt LaFleur. I mean, <laughs> you talk about how Kyle Shanahan maybe knew what he was going to throw at him, but shouldn't that work inversely as well? I mean, this is a guy who was under Shanahan for years. He he should know. He's like great friends with him. He should know the ins and outs of the offense as well, just like Shanahan does of LaFleur's. And if anything, he should know more about Shanahan's offense because we are not running Shanahan's offense. We're running the Matt LaFleur offense. But yeah, it just looked, it was, it had to be so embarrassing for Matt LaFleur. I mean, he's, he and Robert Sala, the 49ers defensive coordinator, they were the best man, best men at each other's weddings. That's his best friend over there. And he just got bodied on national television. It was, it had to be so embarrassing embarrassing for him he had to look like such a little brother out there with the big dogs um and I just think this I mean I said it about the the um the Chargers game a couple weeks ago but I said that was the the worst we've seen from LaFleur and I think he topped that with the the 49ers game which I mean those things happen with rookie head coaches he's not going to be perfect he's learning along the way but this is definitely a learning moment a learning moment that game that entire game really I don't think he did anything anything that he wanted to do that he expected to do it was just it was just embarrassing on offense i my biggest problem was going into halftime with you know they were up you know 23 to nothing uh, my my thoughts were okay we have to make some kind of adjustment and then he comes out at halftime saying we're going to stick with the plan and uh, you know although obviously as a coach you don't want to deviate from something you spent a whole week you know conforming to the opponent after studying countless hours, uh, but obviously it wasn't working. I mean, we just weren't getting anything done. And even when we were just, and it's like the same thing that happened to us in all of our losses. Every time we got something going, a penalty would bring us back or whatever would bring us back. And after the bye week, you'd think that's something we would have corrected and, you know, self-scouted. And we talked about this self-scouting during the bye week, and it just didn't come to fruition. Nothing, nothing that we that we thought would get done during the bye week got done on that football field that Sunday night, and uh, it was disappointing. Uh, but but like I was alluding to, not changing something up, not dialing up something, both on offense and defense. We just we just played that game. That second half, we just played that game to lose. We had no, I, and. Matt LaFleur kind of talked about it later in the week. He He's kind of, you know, people are asking him about uh, no huddle offense and, you know, just just the overall pace of play on offense. And we, coming out of the third quarter, we had that drive where we scored that touchdown, but it, it ended up chewing off almost the entire quarter. And you're just looking at it like we need to score more than eight points if we're going to win this game after we started down 23 nothing. So to come out and, t- you know, just run a huddle offense where we're taking off, you know, 45 seconds every down, that, that was hard to watch because as a Packers fan, you're trying to, you know, increase the urgency. And, and Aaron Rodgers kind of wasn't allowed to do that based on what Matt LaFleur had in the cards. And that, that comes with the not making any adjustment and sticking with that plan. So hopefully he learns from that uh, going forward. Uh, because sometimes, and Mike McCarthy struggled with this at times as well, and it's the stubbornness, and it works to his advantage, and sometimes it doesn't work like this time. But you have to be willing to adapt, and you have to be willing to adjust based on what the game is throwing at you. And you, you, you cannot be stubborn in that case, because that's how you're going to win the game, by adjusting. Even though you spent hours studying all, of, all throughout the week, you know, to have this plan to beat this team. If it's not working, we have to move on, move forward and, and go to something else that could work. But 
overall, the offense just had to be better, and, and it wasn't. And, and that was very disconcerting, uh, you know, against a team that we might have to face again in the playoffs. I completely agree with that, 100%. The the offensive game plan, sticking to that in the second half was just ridiculous, in my opinion. I, and you go back to the Chargers game, and at half, we're down 9 nothing. Nine to zero. We come out the second half. It's no huddle, quick tempo. We're playing like we're down eight scores. It's that annoyed me because we got away from the running game. We got away from the entire game plan. And so I was critical of that decision to move away from that entirely. And so was Matt LaFleur post game. He said that he wished he stuck to the run, wished he stuck to the things they worked on throughout the week. But then this game at half, we're down 23 nothing. And that, that is like that. And then we come out the half and we're, like you said, the same game plan, take 10 minutes off our first drive the second half. Um, like, shouldn't have those have been flipped? Shouldn't have we been coming out, sticking to the game plan in the Chargers game, and then coming out of the 49ers game with the no huddle, just ditch the game plan, play backyard football offense? I, that was so stupid to me. It, I, it was just ridiculous that we're acting like we're only down 9 nothing in in the second half of the Niners game. When we were da- we were down three scores, like let's go. Aaron's like walking back and forth to the huddle. He's giving all these signals and taking his time. Five seconds on the play clock. Like, can you snap the ball? Can we get the call in, line up, and run a play? It was ridiculous. Yeah, man, that is the one thing. It's been over two weeks since that game, but that that third quarter drive, we pretty much let the Niners have have the ball in both halves. The turnover right away, two minutes in the first quarter, gave they gave the Niners a free touchdown. Then the Niners get the ball to start the second half. And we stop them. And and we're obviously down 23. We're going to need three touchdowns and at least two two-point conversions. And <laughs> we melt off eight minutes off the clock, like you guys were saying, 13 plays, just no urgency at all. And, and you just knew the Niners' offense isn't going to just go away. We saw our defense get cooked by big plays in the first half. And then right after that touchdown, <laughs> the Niners pull off a two-play 57-second drive capped off by a 61 yard George Kill touchdown and that was that was just a dagger that was it was pretty much over after that you just you just knew nothing that was just that was just a killer you waste 8 minutes formulating your first touchdown just for the Niners to do the same thing in in a minute it was just demoralizing and yeah I'm with you man I wish I wish that second half we we were more urgent and you know at least I wish we could have scored quicker and like Ah, it just it pisses me off thinking about thinking about it. But yeah, that was that's the thing that sticks out to me after to looking back. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers kind of talked about that sense of urgency that you know everybody was questioning why why would we take such a drive that kind of just kind of you know we we threw the game away at that point regardless of whether we scored or not throwing eight minutes away for eight points it just was not it was not efficient and. You know, he was asked about it, you know, both after the game and later in the week. And he kind of talked about how that's not his call to, you know, run no huddle and do the thing that he does best. And, uh, you know, that was Matt LaFleur's call. Uh, So hopefully, you know, and we've talked we've also heard about some leadership meeting, uh, a leadership council similar to what we've seen in in Mike McCarthy uh, seasons. Uh, you know, guys like the only confirmed guys that we know that are involved in that are, are Aaron Rodgers, Darius Smith, Preston Smith, and Mercedes Lewis. There could be more, uh, but you have to think one of the things that they talked about was being being more urgent uh, on offense and maybe even the defensive side of the ball as well. Uh, that's got to be something that they had to talk about. And, you know, they uh, the players talked about how they had some things that they wanted to, to talk to Matt LaFleur about, both big and small. And Matt LaFleur was, you know, he had no problem with it and he was willing to communicate and, and the players praised him afterward, you know, they praised him for, you know, just being the guy that, that can relate to his players, that lets his players, you know, have input on everything they do. So that way, as a cohesive unit, they're going to be able to have the most success possible with great lines of communication and great play on the field as well. And and that all starts from up top and, and Matt LaFleur has done an excellent job in that aspect. So. You know, a couple of bad games in L.A. and in San Francisco, you, you can't take away what he's done for the, for the Packers so far. And he's changed the culture and very, very much for the better. So, uh, you know, I'm just looking forward to, to what we can do going forward. And, and maybe that'll start changing. Maybe, you know, when it comes time to run that no huddle, 
you know, LaFleur will be able to let Rodgers take the reins a little bit and, and let him go do what he does best. So uh, I, I'm just excited to see what we can do going forward. Yeah, I think that meeting was awesome. And I think the I saw the main topic in that meeting was just like player communication, player input. And I took that as kind of like maybe the coaching staff – wants to do one thing and the players want to do another and the coaching staff is kind of tuning out the players i don't know i could be completely wrong but uh that's kind of what i took that as it took that meeting as and yeah that's awesome that lafleur he, he's like he's so young he's only he's only 40 he's in his first year of coaching he he's gonna have some uh learning curves along the way and um maybe listening to his players more maybe that's something we needed maybe i mean you look at the the san francisco game the defense was atrocious, and it looked like we were never in the the right positions on defense. No one was. Never looked like we were in the right play call. So maybe the defenders were like, "Hey, we know what we know what to expect here. Let us let us take the reins a little bit more." Um, yeah, that's awesome. Though. Now, guys, let's let's take a look at the defensive side of the ball. Personally, the the only bright spot I saw was was the fact that I feel I felt like. They get the benefit of the doubt in the first half. They were they were dealing with a lot of short field situations, and the Packers had a lot of three and outs, and just they were on defense the whole time. And I felt like if the Packers offense could have put some put some points on the board, this could have been like a a high scoring type game where it was manageable to, that the defense could have you know stayed in it. But obviously that wasn't the case. The defense was constantly out on the field, and and the second half they let up that huge play to Kittle, and then kind of you know, rude to any chance of a comeback. But the one player I saw that had a really good game was Adarius Smith, just constantly in the backfield, constantly in Jimmy Garoppolo's face, finished with one and a half sacks and three quarterback hits. And yeah, he's like pretty much this whole season, but the second half, he's just been on fire. He's just, he, he's just been a different animal. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if he, if he catches press in, in sacks here at this in these uh, last four games, he's just been on a tear. Uh, what do you guys think about the the defense against the Niners? Yeah, Zedarius was an absolute monster, and, and he has been for us. I mean, and, and Preston at times has, has been the guy, and then sometimes it's Zedarius, and sometimes when we get lucky, it's both of them in the same game. But Zedarius has just been a monster for us this season. Uh, but what I want to get into and, and what kind of stood out to me from this game specifically was just was the cornerback play. And it was Kevin King that obviously, you know, he's been so up and down this year. And, and it's been mostly down, especially recently. Uh, this is stat, actually, he actually has allowed the most yards in coverage among all quarterbacks in the NFL, the entire NFL. And that's our that's one of the guys that we, we expected to come in and be shut down. Uh, and Jair Alexander is the other guy, obviously, that he's supposed to be – that's supposed to be our dynamic duo at corner. Uh, and Jair is the guy that teams don't want to throw to, and, and he's done a great job for us this year. And uh, he'll allow catches once in a while, but every cornerback does. And the reason you don't see him making a lot of impact plays is because teams just don't want to throw at him. But Kevin King, he is open for business. Teams will target him, and he struggles mightily. He allows so many completions, and obviously he's allowed the most yards in the entire NFL through 13 weeks. That's incredible. I never would have thought that would have been the case beginning the year. I mean, he's he's got great ball skills. He's gotten a lot of interceptions for us. He just got one last week against the Giants. Uh, but in coverage this year, he's just been a liability. And when he's playing well, he's good for us. But he just hasn't been playing well, well enough to, you know, really have cemented himself alongside Jair Alexander as, as an elite corner in the NFL. So. I don't know. What did you guys think of Kevin King's performance, not just on Sunday night, but, you know, this season so far? I have to agree, man. He's just – it's like I was so high on him. I've been high on him his entire career. He's been – I'm like an avid defender of Kevin King. Like you said, Jair is locked down every – almost every week at least. He is shutting down whoever's across from him. So naturally – Actually, of course, teams are going to attack Kevin King because he's our worst corner. And every week he's doing that. The Giants uh, scored a touchdown on him. I thought he played pretty well versus New York. But uh, it's just it, every every week teams are attacking him. And it's an issue. I think his spot has to be up for competition, right? I mean, it's just not good enough. It's not good enough when teams can attack him. We know they're going to attack him. And it's still an issue every single week. But uh, 
I mean, as a defense, I think the issues have been there all season. It's the two the two big ones are explosive plays allowed, which we lead the league in. We lead the league in uh, 40, 40 plus yard plays allowed on defense, and then run defense. I mean, our run defense was atrocious versus San Francisco, and we allowed a garbage offensive line in New York and Saquon Barkley to have his best game in weeks. I mean, speaking on the run defense, you look at the defensive line. We got Kev- Kenny Clark, who's great, uh, borderline all pro type of talent there. And But we have no one else beside him. We have Montrevious Adams, hasn't been good enough. Tyler Lancaster, hasn't been good enough. And then Dean Lowry has had some flashes, but largely hasn't been good enough. We have a, a bunch of replacement level guys on the on the defensive line and then Kenny Clark. And that's easy to take care of if you're opposing offense. You just double him because no one else is going to win their one-on-ones. And the running lanes are there every single week. And the running lanes, who's going to fill those? It's supposed to be our linebackers. And when we have Blake Martinez as our best inside linebacker, uh, we're going to have a bad run defense. And we have, we've seen it all season. Blake Martinez... I, th- I I love the guy. He seems like a great dude, but I, I don't know if he's the guy. I don't know. I don't know what he is at this point. This season, he's been so up and down and mostly down, really. Uh, you know, we've said it a hundred times, but his strength is supposed to be the run game, and he's a liability in the run game. He's always in the wrong, wrong spot, it seems like, and I don't think the I don't think it helps that he doesn't have anyone bes- beside him of note, and he doesn't have anyone up front of note, other than Kenny Clark, of course. So... The run defense is just it's in it's an issue, but the explosive plays are just as bad because we <laughs> it's it's week fourteen and this has been an issue going back to last year. I it's got to be a Mike Penton issue, right? Because we have so much talent in the secondary. How are we allowing this many explosive plays in the pass game? It's kind of ridiculous. And going back to the San Francisco game, it was the worst it's been, probably. The, the secondary play because we were getting carved up and maybe that's Kyle Shanahan maybe it's the the speediness the quickness of the San Francisco receivers because our defensive backs are very aggressive they're going to jump on double moves they're going to bite on that type of stuff which is great when it's uh when it's when it's like a, a curl route or something like that and the cornerbacks can break up a pass but it's off against the smart team that's going to take advantage of that and run double moves all game and that George Kittle like uh that corner we or that corner post route that he ran for the 57 yard touchdown it's just ridiculous and we, those are two areas that we need to clean up we've been saying it all season we need to clean up the we need to clean those parts of our defense up and it hasn't happened I'm starting to think that's just who we are on defense and yeah I think that's definitely a Mike Pettin issue yeah but I mean you look at our defense and our formula for, you know, winning the football game on defense has just been to tighten up in the red zone and create turnovers. And, and in the red zone, we've, you know, we're top three in a lot of major categories, you know, scoring efficiency, 75% of the time teams score in the red zone. And that's, that's a great number considering, you know, you're, you're right there in prime position to score on offense and our defense is, is putting them away one out of four times. So, uh, and then quarterback rating, uh, opposing quarterbacks have a 65.9 rating, which is second in the NFL. Uh, completions, 45.9%. That's second in the NFL. Touchdown percentage is only 11.5% in the red zone. That's first in the league. And then we have four red zone interceptions, which is also first in the league. So uh, teams are giving up, we're, we're giving up chunk plays on, and we're giving up a lot of third downs, you know, to offenses during the drive. But then we get really stingy when it comes to, you know, the short field and the red zone. So uh, it's, it's a, it's an interesting formula considering the kind of team that we are, where we're, where we thrive in the pass rush and we kind of make, we want to make it easier uh, on our secondary, which is not that great. And it hasn't been that great this year, but it, whatever, I, mean, I don't know. It's, it's hard to, it's hard to say that's truly working because of what teams are kind of doing against us on that side of the ball. And I don't know. We're it's gonna have to. We're gonna have to make it work. We're gonna have to make it work with Blake. We're gonna have to make it work with Kevin King. If we want to start winning football games, it's gonna have to start working. So we're gonna have to figure it out. Yeah, I think the red zone defense makes perfect sense because, like I said, all these guys are so aggressive and they defend the short routes so well because they're so aggressive. They're gonna jump on every kind of slant or in route. They're gonna jump on all that stuff and they're gonna break up passes, get interceptions. 
But when you move away from, if you have more than 20 yards to defend, they're just so unreliable. They they have like, they're, they're the worst defense in the league. Um, the past, since like week four, I think, I think it was. I'm sure they've moved up after the Giants game, but... I mean, I don't know why teams just don't run on us in the red zone. That's what I don't get. I mean, the 49ers did it, and it worked great. <laughs> Our run defense is terrible. Why aren't you just running? I don't know. Yeah, man, the turnovers this season have pretty much just been the difference. Um, the three three losses we have this season, all three of them, we the defense didn't come up with a single turnover. And, and all nine of our wins, we've had at least one. And, and looking at this Giants game, we, we were able to pick off Daniel Jones three times. So... That that was kind of expected. We Saquon Barkley and the offensive line have been really struggling this year. Um, Daniel Jones, rookie quarterback, has lost. I think he lost seven straight games coming in this week. So that was expected. But the Packers defense able to bounce back after a very rough showing against the Niners was it was really good to see. And we kind of have a, a nice stretch before the Vikings game to kind of get back on track and you know see if we can. You know, be a stable defense against mediocre teams. We got, we got, um, you know, Dwayne Haskins coming up next, and we got Mitch Trubisky. So, seeing the Packers defense play well against the Giants is just, you know, it's it's good to see that we don't get beat up by by poor teams. The the Giants offense has been bad. They have probably the most talented running back in the NFL, and haven't really been able to, you know, get him going. So, and we held them to only 83 yards on the ground. And after after that terrible loss to the Niners it was just good to see um what are your guys' initial thoughts after the after the win in, in New York yeah we definitely were able to you know use the weather to our advantage even in New York and come out with a big win and uh, we needed that not only for you know our standings but just our overall confidence in this football team uh you know the question is I mean can we beat a team with a good quarterback can we beat a team you know that's that's a playoff team we have yet to we've yet to really see if we can do that. I mean, the best quarterback we've played so far is it has to be what Carson Wentz, maybe maybe Dak Prescott. You know, can we go into a place like Seattle and, and play, you know, Russell Wilson? I don't know. It depends how we're going to be able to do uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, but against this Giants team, a team we should have beat and a team that we had to come out and at least, you know, make some kind of a statement about that we're better than we're better than bad and we're a lot better than good. And I think we did that. Obviously Aaron Rodgers said he, that he had to get hot and, and he did four touchdowns, 280 odd, some odd yards. And uh, that was, that was big to get him hot after maybe a couple games where we, we weren't able to get anything going with him. Uh, it was good to see him have a big performance like that. Obviously Alan Lazard uh, came out and kind of burst onto the scene once again. Uh, that was huge for us because like we say every week, we need a guy besides Devontae Adams to come out and make plays in the passing game in order to have any kind of offense. And, and you know, when a guy like Alan Lazard comes out and, and does his job and, and plays really well, it takes a lot of pressure off everybody else. You know, Aaron Jones, Devontae Adams, and Aaron Rodgers. And it, it just gives us another way to win. And uh, Aaron Jones, you know, the running game wasn't great. I'm not sure why that was. I think the game plan was mostly to, to put Aaron Rodgers and, and the passing game in, in more spots to, you know, to win battles and, and make plays. But uh, I, it's it, and we got Aaron Jones involved in the passing game. We got Jamal Williams involved in the passing game. And, you know, that definitely helped us out, too. But uh, I think the offensive performance, uh, it was definitely something we needed. And it was great to see that in, in the in the snowy weather. Uh, and on defense, on the defensive side of the ball, we played well. Obviously, we. Uh, we had a bit of a rough first half. Uh, they they got moving a little bit. Obviously, Daniel Jones had that touchdown and no interceptions going into the second half. Uh, and then, obviously, we were able to pick him off uh, three times, which was good. But we have to be better. We, I'm still not satisfied with how we played. We can't let Daniel Jones hang around with us for a, a full half of football. And uh, that's going to be key when we're playing better quarterbacks like I was getting into earlier. So. Uh, that was a good win. You have to take what you can get there. 31 to 13, essentially a blowout. Uh, but obviously there's a lot, a lot of room, a lot of room for improvement on both sides of the football. Yeah. It, I mean, the final score does look like a blowout, but I feel like during the game, it was a lot more frustrating to watch than we'd like to remember. I mean, the offense went on these, these periods where 
it looked like everything was so difficult and they were struggling to move the ball uh, a few punts uh in the middle of the game we we were at 17 points it was the score was 17 to th- 17 to 13 for quite a while i think almost the entire third quarter yeah the entire third quarter was 70, 17 to 13 um so that that's not I, I don't i'm trying not to put too much stock into this win cuz i think the issues we have are still persistent i think they're still obvious especially on defense you look at these things like the two of Daniel Jones's interceptions were just terrible throws, just terrible reads and terrible throws. The one Tremont Williams interception was just a great play, but not the best throw. I mean, how many other quarterbacks are going to make those types of throws? Not very many. I, I, like you said, against a good quarterback, I'm very scared. I'm very scared of what a good quarterback is going to be able to do against Mike Pettin in this defense. I, I keep saying Mike Pettin, but I really do think he's the issue because we have so much talent. We have Darnell Savage, who's a playmaker. Adrian Amos, who's so reliable. Jair Alexander's a star. Kevin King is probably the weakest part of our secondary. Um, and then we have a great pass rush. I just don't get it. Um, and then in the offense, this is the worst secondary in the league. It is just awful. And so obviously the game plan going into it was – put the ball in Aaron's hands and let him just carve him up, which he did with uh, four touchdowns and a 125 rating. But uh, the run game was just, it was going nowhere. It was weird. It was because the Giants run defense is not good. A lot of teams might have a bad secondary, but a good run defense. That's not the Giants. They are just a terrible defense. (laughs) Um, It was just weird watching Leonard Williams have a really great game. He hasn't had a good game in how many years? Um, They were just shutting everything down up front which was crazy to me. I was not expecting that at all. In the cold weather, I thought we would have a, a pretty good day on the ground, but we did not. Aaron Jones had maybe his worst game of the season, um, and the blocking was just not good enough for either of the running backs. Um, so I think there are, like you like you both said, I think there are still things to improve on, but maybe maybe a blowout win like or a, quote, blowout win uh, helps the morale of this team, reminds them that they, they are a, a really good, a uh, really good football team, and uh, I mean these these games against New York and Washington. I think they really only matter of it's really only a matter of building momentum into Chicago and Minnesota and into the playoffs later on. So I don't want to put too much stock into this win. Uh, it's just nice to get a win in December. Yeah, you talk about you know these games coming up, and really when it comes down to, you know, the playoffs, it's about which team is hot at the right time. And, and that could be us, you know, a big win here, 31 to 13. Uh, and obviously coming up, we have the Redskins, the bears. And if we can, if we can kind of finish this season without a loss, that could be huge for, you know, not only our seating where we would likely get a buy if we finished at 13 and three, uh, but it would be big for our momentum and, and our playoff chances. But, uh, you know, going back to this this Giants game, I really think the reason we won uh, was because of a, a sudden change in, in our ability to convert on third down uh, after really a struggling, you know, we, we struggled in that area against the 49ers. Obviously, that has a lot to do with the opponent, but, uh, you know, we, we, we converted a lot of third and longs that we weren't getting against the Niners. We even converted a fourth and we even converted a fourth and 10, uh, you know, that but Geronimo Allison had a great catch. Rodgers, as he's getting hit, throws a beautiful ball. That was our first. That was our first fourth down conversion of the entire season. Fun yeah. fact. Yeah, that is that, and it was a it was a big one because you know they would have gotten the ball back and we would have only had a four point lead and that's the all gas no breaks mentality that that Matt Lafleur pushes to his players, but. Yeah, Geronimo had a nice game as well. Uh, I forgot to mention how he kind of rebounded after. Really, he hasn't been great this year, but he had a nice game. Uh, but what was interesting to me was this was a game where we, we lost the time of possession, which is something that we've kind of won in nearly all of our wins. Uh, and once again, we were outgained, which isn't surprising. In yards, we, we actually uh, we didn't get as many yards as the Giants, even though we won by 18 points, and that's been a common theme of the Mike Pettin-led defense with, with who we've got out there. So, you know, that's that's been the way we, we've we been playing defense. And, uh, yeah, it's just – that it was, a, it was a good game. A lot of things to take away and a lot of things that we can use to hopefully move forward and hopefully we can come out with a win against uh, a similar team like the Washington Redskins who might have an even worse quarterback at the helm. 
Yeah, it was it was fun to see the offense have fun towards the end of that game. The Packers had a had a ten point lead, and Aaron Rodgers called the audible to get Mercedes Lewis a touchdown on the on the one yard line for his first score as a Packer. And it's been he's been here for a season and almost and a a season in twelve games. So that was that was cool to see. It's cool to see that they're having fun, and you know, playing as a team even even after that the loss last week. So, and another thing is I, I honestly think we found an, a solid wide receiver too behind Devonte Adams and Alan Lazard. He's, he's just a big body. Like I, I don't know what preseason me was thinking. I really was a Darius Shepard kind of, I wanted him to make the roster to, and see if he could be our, our Randall Cobb replacement and play in the slot. But this Alan Lazard guy is he's going off. He's just catching everything. Aaron seems to have a good chemistry with him. Aaron hit him on that, that deep, free play ball and then obviously he scored that long touchdown too it's that was that was something that we were kind of scared about earlier in the season when Geronimo was struggling and MVS kind of just disappeared from the offense we weren't sure who the second guy would be in the in the passing game but Alan Lazard is honestly turning into be that and I'm and it, that was such a good find I'm glad he was he was picked up on the practice squad after he got cut in the preseason that he's turning out to be a real contributor on this offense I mean outside of Devonte, is there a guy Rogers trust more than Lazard right now. I mean Jimmy Graham maybe, but yeah, Lazard's just been been a great a great find by Brian Kudigans picking him up last year from the Jaguars practice squad. Uh yeah, he's he's really looking like he could develop into our next like uh maybe uh, Geronimo Allenton is a bad example cuz he never really panned out. At least he hasn't yet, but uh yeah, like that was that was just a great find. Uh, undrafted free agent that we developed and Aaron worked a relationship with and maybe Lazar's going to be even better than Geronimo's panning out to be uh, it certainly looks like it right now at least because he looks like he can play with the big boys <laughs> you know what I mean he looks like a a proven vet out there sometimes and he makes all these tough catches that maybe may, who else on the roster can make some of these like really contested catches he's got such a big frame he can he's his catch radius is really wide he can haul in almost anything and it's great to have a guy like that on a roster with very little receiving talent yeah I mean this was a big game for for him and and even some of the other guys uh like we talked about Geronimo had a nice game uh talk about reliable guys though I mean Lazard has just he's been reliable and after Adams we haven't had that we've had guys who are too inconsistent to really count on when it matters and just that reliability, that consistency is – that's really all – that's all you can ask for, just a consistent player. That way you know what you're getting when you go out there on Sunday and, and play a football game. So, And and another guy that's really consistent is Jake Kumaro, but he's kind of – he really hasn't gotten a lot of play time recently. So so you'd like to see a guy like him get more playing time as well. Uh, but Geronimo had a nice game. Hopefully he can kind of uh, add to that uh, coming up here down the stretch and – and hopefully Marquez Valdez Scanlon can kind of just 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 do something, you know. I mean, he had that great uh, that great game against the Chiefs, and since then he's been kind of he's just been missing in action. Like I don't even know how to put it. He's just he really struggled, and even even when he's gotten opportunities, he's dropped the ball, you know, whatever the case may be. He's just not getting open, whatever. So uh, we're missing we're missing a guy like EQ right now. Equinemius St. Brown. I definitely think we're missing him, and it's a shame he had to be put on I, I, on IR for the season. But uh, with the guys we've got, I think we can do some damage. We just have to get hot at the right time, and, and last game was a good start, and maybe we can kind of settle in even more against the Redskins. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, EQ would be great right now. I know, I know, Braun, you also love EQ. I mean, I've been saying it since last year's draft. I think he's better than MVS. Uh, He's just so talented. He's so big. He's so quick. He's got great hands, which is something that maybe MVS doesn't have. Um, I mean, in hindsight, what is Brian Gutekunst thinking with that decision to put him on IR before the uh, the 4 p.m. deadline so that he can't return this year? Like, what? That was that was so weird. This has been an issue going back to training camp, our receiver depth. We knew it was going to be an issue. Why are you just shelving him for an entire season? I don't know. But it, yeah, he was, would definitely. It was, it was to keep Darius Shepard on the roster. That was really what what it came down to, and that that's really disappointing. I mean, 
I don't know. I, we don't know the extent to which his injury, you know, limits him from actually coming back or not. But if, if his injury wasn't as bad as people are, you know, assuming it was because he was put on IR to start the year. I mean, that's just very disappointing. And I, I bet that's a, a move Brian Gutekunst wishes that he didn't make. That's like a whole like, I mean, you think long term that could impact his career. A sophomore season for a young six round pick like that is so important. This year of development in a new offense, and uh, I, I don't like thinking about what he could be doing right now because I think he would be really good for us right now. Um, yeah, you kind of saw that after Geronimo. I mean, he started hot last year, and EQ flashed some things in his rookie season. Uh, and after Geronimo sat out the year, and now he's back, and we expected him to kind of pick up where he left off, and he just hasn't done that. So hopefully EQ can do that. Uh I mean, it's going to be tough because now he's coming back after not playing football for an entire year. Uh, it's just a tough blow for him, and that was, that was a tough blow for us as well as, a, as an organization. Like EQ had chemistry with Rodgers. We saw it in, the, in that 49ers comeback drive. He, he had that crazy sideline catch and the, when um, you know we were driving down the field with no timeouts. And just Aaron being able to have the trust in him to you know throw it to him with with the time kind of ticking down and trust in a rookie, like I, I do feel like I agree with you guys. I feel like he could be a big contributor on this roster. He, he's kind of, I think Alan Lazard has kind of taken the role that Equinemius could be, could be in right now. Yeah. That, that, that play in uh, against San Francisco, that was, that was crazy. I mean, we, <laughs> we never really see Aaron go to guys he's not too familiar with in moments like that, especially. And that was such like a, that was, it was a back shoulder throw, high risk throw. It was a, a sight adjustment that he trusted EQ to make. And he did. He had also had that, uh, a couple nice catches at Minnesota last year, week 12. Yeah. I mean, the ability to get his feet down on that play, I mean, I, that had to just immensely increase his chemistry with Rodgers and, and, tr- and his trust as well. And yeah, like you said, Alan Lazard, I feel like he's got a similar body type and they've got similar catch radiuses. Uh, obviously, EQ coming out, that that was kind of his thing. He's a big bodied guy who's also very fast and he's got a catch radius where he can just go up and get a lot of different, you know, balls that come his way. But uh, I think Lazard has kind of he's at least filled that role that we that we were missing. So it's definitely nice to have Alan and uh, he's been playing great. Hopefully he continues that going down the stretch here and uh yeah i mean just it's nice to have a guy that hopefully we can start to rely on even more uh, to be inconsistent uh, to be a consistent you know number two guy for us that we haven't had so far all right let's move on to a preview of this week's matchup with the three and nine washington redskins um they're not a good football team obviously they're not having the season maybe they hope for with Dwayne Haskins. I mean, they fired Drake, Jake Rudin midseason, which is never a good sign for a team. Uh, their front office is out of their minds. They got no clue what they're doing over there, but they have won two games in a row, including a win last week against the Carolina Panthers. And it was a pretty convincing win, really. So maybe they're getting hot. Maybe they're going to challenge us a little bit more than the Giants did. But, uh, I don't see them as a threat, really. I mean, everyone everyone's kind of saying right now, oh, don't take Washington lightly, you know. Uh, this could be a trap game, but th- that's so stupid. I mean, you should never take any NFL team lightly. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, this game is kind of similar to that matchup with the Giants. Uh, I mean, well, last year the Redskins did end up going in and beating us. I mean, that was one of our nine losses last year, but still, I mean, that wasn't a game people expected us to go out and lose. So, uh, I mean, yeah. Similar to the Giants, they are coming off two wins, though. So they were 1-9 and nine before, uh, you know, over the last two weeks, they've actually picked up two wins, one against the Lions and then one, like you said, against the Panthers. So uh, I would have to think that Dwayne Haskins is a bit worse than than Daniel Jones. Uh, but still, I think they're going to – I think their offense is going to give us a lot of problems. And I'm just saying that because – and I'm I'm just saying that because our defense just gives up a lot of big plays and yardage, and against good running backs we're gonna we're gonna crumble. And they've got two or three of them. They've got Chris Thompson. That they've got Adrian Peterson, and and they've got Darius Geis back from injured reserve, and he's been on a tear. So I don't know. It, it's gonna be a tough matchup. They don't have too many threats at receiver, but obviously they've got Terry McLaurin, the the rookie who's been excellent for them this year. But uh, Jair can probably take care of him 
but I'm very concerned about their run game, and I'm concerned about Kevin King. I'm concerned about a lot of different things. Uh, I'm not concerned about our pass rush against this uh, Redskins offensive line. Uh, but it's a game we should win, and we should win big. Hopefully, we can capitalize off a, off that Giants victory, you know, that, that kind of huge win, that blowout win. Hopefully, we can do the same, and that's just going to build momentum for us. And, and like we said, we need to be one of the hottest teams with, with a hot quarterback. And we need to be playing at our best uh, in December and as these playoffs uh, are coming around, and we need to get, you know, the best seeding possible, and we've got some d- tough matchups ahead, so... Uh, this will be a good a good game to hopefully propel all that into uh, tough matchups against both the Bears and the Vikings and then the Lions right after that. So, uh, yeah, this is a big one. Like even after the Redskins best two games of the season, they beat the Lions and the Panthers. They are still ranked last in points per game, yards per game and time of possession per game. They got Darius Geis back, like you were saying, and he's been he's been on a roll lately. These past two games, he's pretty much propelled them to to both of their wins, but, but still this, this Washington offense is, is, it's just terrible. Dwayne Haskins is not, it, it, he's not ready for NFL play yet. They're kind of, they, they threw him out there a little too early. Um, They got Case Keenum on the bench just in case, but still like, I, I really hope if, if this Packers defense struggles against this Redskins offense, there, there's going to be a little concern. Definitely. Um, this is the type of game, I hope it's not a trap game, but this is the type of game the Packers just have to go out on their home turf and just and just dominate. Like, the, the, the Washington defense is is okay. It's in the middle of the pack, kind of leaning towards, you know, bottom 16, but right in the middle. But, but still, it, the Packers are coming home for the first time in a couple weeks, and it's, yeah, it, you just got to you gotta beat up on these Redskins. You, you really do. There, there should be no excuse. Yeah, no excuses. I don't care what they've done the past two weeks. I don't care uh, the the trap game. Like, they are a bad football team. They have bad, bad talent on that roster. They don't have a head coach right now. Dwayne Haskins is not developed at all. I think he can be with a competent head coach, which he doesn't have right now. But, yeah, there are no excuses. The Packers should win this game and win by double digits. Um Will they pose a bigger threat than the Giants did? I don't know. Maybe they will. Maybe, maybe they're going to put up a tough fight. I mean, Adrian Peterson and Darius Guy seem to have a good uh, one-two punch right now as a running back duo. So maybe, you know, run defense is the weakness of our team. So is explosive plays, which Terry McLaren has a lot of. So maybe, maybe they do score some points more than we'd like to see from such a terrible offense, like you said, Mason. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we have no reason to lose this game. It would I don't even want to think about us potentially losing this game because we shouldn't. We should blow the doors off of this team. What are your guys' uh, score predictions for this game? Give me a give me a top performer as well. 56 to 3. No, nah, I'm kidding. Uh probably more like uh I don't know, 35 to uh, I'll give them I'll spot them 21 points. Two two garbage time touchdowns. And top performer, uh, uh, Aaron Jones. I think he has a nice rebound game. It's going to be cold. December football at Lambeau Field. Uh, maybe we ride the ground game a little bit more than we did last week. Yeah, um, I don't think I don't think our offensive, especially if it's going to be cold, I don't think we're going to be throwing up 40 pointers or a 50 burger or anything. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna say 32 to 10. You, you got to give the Redskins a little a little something. And the top performer for me would probably be – I'm going to go with Aaron Rodgers. I really do think Aaron Rodgers is kind of realizing he's he's not on pace to have that that crazy, you know, MVP-type conversation type season that he was having, you know, after the Raiders and Chiefs game. So, And after throwing four touchdowns last week, I think he's going to going to want to throw maybe three or four more this game. So I'm going to say Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, I'm with you on Aaron Rodgers there. I, I think he, you know, he said he's got to get hot, and, and I believe that he will, and I think he's going to continue that. Uh, I'm going to say he gets, I think this is going to be a big game, and I just really feel like this is going to be one of those games where, you know, the Giants game was like just a start to what we what we got to do, 
and maybe we can just like like I said, we can propel to you know even better this week against a similar team. I'm gonna say we do get up to 40. I'm gonna say 42, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna give the Redskins 23. And I think Rodgers is gonna throw for. I'm gonna say he's gonna throw for four touchdowns. Jones will get two on the ground, uh, and I'm gonna give Rodgers the performer, uh, the the best performance. If we can score 42. It won't even matter the opponent. <laughs> that'll just be, that'll just be amazing. That'll be, we'll all be so hype rolling into Minnesota. That's uh, gonna be. I mean, yeah. Again, with with big division games coming up, we need all the momentum we can get. So, yeah, having two big wins, uh, you know, in a row would be nice. Although history wouldn't tend to lead us in that direction because our biggest two wins this season. I mean, biggest as in most impressive were. Uh, Raiders Chiefs and then we laid an egg versus LA Chargers but uh you know I think those two maybe those two losses out in California helped this team help Matt LaFleur realize what he's bad at help them fix it maybe we did some self-scouting after the 49ers game instead of the bye week which makes no sense but maybe we're a different team maybe that's in the past and we're on a December deep playoff push run right here hopefully we can uh keep that going against the Redskins this week but uh yeah that's gonna do it for the podcast uh, we'd like to thank you for listening, and you can follow Braun on Instagram at Lambo Leapers and Mason on Instagram at Packer Posts and Twitter at Packer Posts, and you can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at All Day Packers. And yeah, thanks for listening, and uh, we'll see you next week. Go Pack, go!